My mic sound nice. Check one. My mic sound nice. Check two. Let's get it in, people. Yeah. Uh huh. People they lie for it, they die for it. To get a loan, something to go apply for it. Signing life away on a dotted line for it. In the past, people committed murder, murder crimes, crimes for it. it. Thug rappers be spitting the murder, murder rhyme for it. Trying to get you gas off the chain, they sort it. it. Then you looking at them like, yo, yo I, I can't, can't afford, afford it. Why they steady flossing, trying to leave your brain in It's that it's money. money. It's that wealth they can't handle. handle. Don't let the cash play you like a down low sample. Soon they going to suck and start to pull and dismantle. They never rap the hip hop with a positive Take example. example. When homeless people walk the streets of Panhandle, we walk around in hundred dollar jeans, see the sandals. I was viewing hip hop as a fad or novelty. novelty. I'm a spy, the poor, live in my poverty. Each one, reach one, is what it's gotta, gotta be. be. Not as grabbing mice, ripping for the freaking dollar feet. feet. Them stacks that roll that dough. He'll purchase you with smack clean. Plus hoes, money can't loss or mislead we souls. When people kill for money, there's a rank rose. Money that your progress rose. We can put your life on hold. Money that your dignity souls. Won't be bruised by the capital code. Won't let my people fold to that corrupt oil and gold. It's that money, that almighty dollar. 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 Yo, on the back of reads and God we trust. We be worship in that green, but to God we hush. Some are calling for the cash, cash never having enough. enough. Some get 30 for that green, it's that green they lust. It's that money, that almighty dollar. 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 Hey yo, it's that money that close your eyes, turn your back. Money that turn a friend into a rap money that anybody act funny, get clap money, trap money. Now your name's on a 1040, now you trap money. Once you hooked, you a fool for the paper. Wu-Tang still yelling cash rules millions later. It changed people when they start making big chips. chips. Good hearted poor man turn into a rich prick. Rick. I seen it happen. We all seen it go, go down. down. I spit it out cause it's too bitter to choke down. down. That same dollar that you cramming down my throat now. Down. Miss New Orleans on its way to bail out Motown. Down. Student loans a catastrophe. Down. As for me, if I'm jaded, halfway to a master's degree. To the academy, I'm unsatisfactory. If they had me, I'd gladly work in the Tucker's factory. I'm on paper for life. The paper chase caught up and I'm paying the price one more time. Yo, yes. I'm on paper for life. life. The paper chase caught, caught up, up and I'm paying the price. It's that, that, money, the that money, the almighty dollar. It's that money, the almighty dollar. It's that money, the almighty dollar. It's that money, the almighty dollar. Yo, on the back of the reason God we trust. We be worshiping that green, but to God we hush. Some were called for the cash, never having enough. Some get dirty for that green, it's that green. Cream they lust, it's that money, the almighty dollar, 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 yo. On the back it reads, in God we trust. trust. We've been worshiping that green, but to God, God we hush. hush. Some work hard for, for the, the cash, cash, never having enough. Some get dirty for that green, it's, it's that, that cream they lust, it's, it's that, that money. Good afternoon. My dad died last June, and our relationship was complicated, but I've always credited him with the fact that I'm an activist and continue to be engaged in the struggle for human and civil rights. 50 years ago, I was four years old, and my parents and I lived in Bloomington, Indiana. My, they were pursuing graduate studies. My dad had just gotten a degree in anthropology and Afro-American studies from Columbia and was interested in the civil rights movement, largely from an academic perspective. But in, 19, in August of 1963, he went with some friends to the March on Washington in Washington, D.C., and it changed him from an observer to an activist, so much so that a year later, he and my mother took jobs at Tougaloo College in Mississippi and moved our family there, officially outside agitators. I grew up on the campus of Tougaloo College when it was the epicenter of the movement in Mississippi. Martin Luther King and other luminaries of the movement stayed at our house when they came to, to town because hotels weren't available to them. Almost all the adults I knew were involved in putting their lives at risk for the cause of freedom and equality, and I know it shaped the woman I was to become. 
This Saturday, I went to the 50th anniversary March on Washington. It was an amazing thing to see that the old leaders, along with the new, committing to work together on issues left unresolved from 1963, and issues that have arisen since then, like immigration reform, gun violence, and marriage equality. There's certainly much yet to do, but I'm convinced that by taking action, each of us affects not only today, but a host of others in the future in ways we can't even imagine, like my dad's decision to go to the march in 1963 affected the course of my life. One of the things that this year's march that I, I felt a little bad about was the lack of a lot of music, the music that formed the soundtrack to my childhood in Tougaloo. So before I sit down, I'd like to share one song that I find particularly helpful in the work for justice today, and I'd like to ask you to join me in singing it. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. Keep on walking, keep on talking, marching up to freedom land. Ain't gonna let segregation Turn me around, turn me around, turn me around. Ain't gonna let segregation turn me around. Keep on walking, keep on a talking, marching up to freedom land. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around. Turn me around, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. Keep on walking, keep on a talking, marching up to freedom land. Thank you. The pledge, standing before the community, of the University of Virginia, 150 years since the Emancipation Proclamation, I affirm my complete personal commitment to the struggle for jobs and justices for all Americans. To fulfill that commitment, I pledge that I will not relax until the victory is won. No relaxing till the victory is won. I pledge that I will join and support all actions undertaken in good faith in accord with the time-honored democratic tradition of nonviolent protest, of peaceable assembly and petition, and of redress through the courts and the legislative process. I pledge to carry this message of this commemoration to my friends and neighbors back home and arouse them to an equal commitment and equal effort. I will march. I will write letters. I will demonstrate and I will vote. And I will work to make sure that my voice and those of my brothers and sisters ring clear and determined from every corner of our land I pledge my heart and my mind and my body unequivocally and without regard to personal sacrifice to the achievement of social peace through social justice. How do you pledge? It is good to see you on today as we celebrate this august occasion. Thank you very much, doctor, for allowing me to be here. It, all, it is always um, important to me to impress on what I call sometimes the normalcy of Dr. Martin Luther King. And his speech was, in fact, not just his speech, but it was a mantra that he said and shared from 
city to city and sea to sea. Dr. Martin Luther King was a Baptist preacher. His father was a Baptist preacher. He preached to a congregation typically less than the people who are in this room. He was not considered to be a great hero at the time. He was a leader. He was a father. He was a husband. He was a person just like all of us. And so it's important to understand when we listen to this speech that we're listening to the words of an ordinary person. Someone said, the poet is unknown but not unwise. I am incomplete. From the top of my head to the soles of my feet, I am incomplete. But I'm made by the master, so they call me a masterpiece. It's important to understand, although he became a monument, Dr. Martin Luther King lived his life as an instrument. And so when we listen and consider the dream and the speech, the challenge for all of us should serenade and resonate in our heart. Are we going to simply celebrate a monumental occasion? Are we going to simply celebrate the monument that stands? Or will we all decide to be an instrument, to be an instrument of change? That is why preachers preach. That is why teachers teach. That is why people do what they've been called to do because they believe that they've been made to be an instrument of change. So the truth is, like the poet said, what happens to a dream deferred? Because all of us have been given a dream. And if we grab a hold of our dream like Dr. King did, then our dreams will not be deferred. They will not sag and explode. But great things can happen because all of us will be instruments of change in high places, other places, low places, in all the places. Because all of us recognize that we have a dream and that dream is to be lived out as instruments, doing something to make a difference every day of our life white, black, educated, uneducated, rich, poor, we're all just instruments in the hands of a mighty God, and we can do great things. So his speech, he hadn't planned to deliver it like that. He was compelled by Mahalia Jackson. He was pushed to tell the story, and he did. But what he told was his heart, and his heart was to be used by God to impact, to be an instrument to this world. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. American democracy, reality or illusion. Although progress has clearly been made in race relations in the United States, our journey to full equality remains incomplete. This was the overriding theme that the marchers at the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington agreed on. I believe it's an illusion for us to think that we live in a true democracy. Many of us were surprised and disappointed by the recent Supreme Court decision gutting perhaps the most precious gift that a democratic society provides its citizens the right to vote. I think that most of us would agree that voting is the language of democracy. Many of us were equally disappointed with the unfortunate outcome when a Florida jury found George Zimmerman not guilty of the murder of unarmed 17-year-old Trayvon Martin. Not only do these two grievous acts take our nation backwards, they diminish our hope for a true democracy. They also, perhaps fortunately, heighten the need for us to dissent, to challenge, and to protest until the rights we feel we lost are restored. We know from history that it won't be easy. As we continue to grieve over Trayvon's death and the arbitrary system 
of justice that disproportionately incarcerate black boys and men. We need to sharpen our focus and find sustainable solutions that will protect the lives of black and poor males in American society. One viable strategy is for us to pay more attention to the education system and insist that our youth have access to alternate ways of learning. To make a real difference, we need to remember that we are all leaders in our community. Your name doesn't have to be Al or Jesse, nor do you have to be appointed by the citizens of your community. The NAACP, with the history, with this history of challenge and protest, must do more. We will do more. Our role becomes even more important. Please join us as we continue to agitate and struggle to realize the full promise of true democracy. In these dark days of uncertainty, I'm inspired by the historian Vincent Harding statement. Well, King and other spiritually grounded leaders in the movement were trying to teach was that our, our, our ultimate goal is to create a new America. An America where blacks and whites, as well as people of all colors, could come together to find common ground for the common good. It's not difficult for most Americans to understand that if you believe in a true democracy, it's worth fighting for, and it's not going to be given to you without an all-out effort and undying devotion. We must challenge ourselves to take a seat at the table and then stand up and answer the call for justice and civil rights. And we must keep dreaming. Thank you. I have a dream or a dream deferred. Education. Education. Is it a dream, a right, or a privilege? I have a dream of achieving an education. Public schools closed in Prince Edward County, Virginia, 1959. Schools closed in Chicago, Illinois, Washington, D.C., 2013. A dream deferred? I have a dream of an education the Higher Education Act of 1965, the creation of Head Start and Upward Bound, allowing education for all. One affords children an opportunity for exposure to preschool, while the other gives first-generation, low-income children access to higher education. I have a dream of education, education curtailed by sequestration, 57,000 students nationwide who will no longer receive Head Start, and over 44,000 students who will no longer receive services from TRIO programs, of which Upward Bound is one. These sequestered funds will go toward an unfunded preschool initiative, really Education, E, everyone, D, deserves, U, urgency, C, courage, A, act, T, tranquil, I, ignite, O, overcome, N, nation. Think about it. Don't let education become the uncashed check.
good afternoon. Um, I'm here today to um, advocate for a reconceptualization of the civil rights movement. Instead of focusing on the 1960s, I'd like to argue that we should have a, we should look at the long civil rights movement in our own century, uh, beginning perhaps in the 20s and continuing through to our own time. Uh, it's a movement. It has highs and lows. It has ups and downs. It has progress and it has setbacks. And it has challenges that demand of each of us courage, will, strength, and commitment. It's a, uh, to illustrate my point, let's look at what happened right after the March on Washington. King and SCLC held a press conference and they announced that we're gonna go into one of four cities next, building on the momentum of this march and, and going straight towards the passage of the Civil Rights Act. One of those cities was Danville, Virginia, which is 120 miles from here. They gathered in a retreat to assess the pros and cons of each, and then the next week, a bomb ripped through 16th Street Baptist Church in, bombing, in Birmingham, killing four small girls. Um, the next, in September, of September 24th, King and the SCLC met in Richmond, Virginia to further assess what they were gonna do and to discuss you know, where they were. King, at first, when he came into Virginia, said he was going into Danville, but the pressure was huge on looking at Birmingham. Um, in fact, um, of the commitments that had been made in May, only one of those commitments had been fulfilled in Birmingham. So he felt he needed a clear-cut victory and, um, the, and SNCC was pressuring King for much more aggressive action to go into, back into Alabama. Um, so King uh, went four times to Birmingham in um, October and November and trying to get some movement on these last two commitments and the in the end, the leaders in Birmingham weren't committed to another mark, uh, another movement. So King went into Danville, launched a campaign there of about five weeks, which continued until Kennedy was shot. Uh, and then, uh, out of respect, it ended. So I tell that as a tale of highs and lows. We think of the march on Washington as, this, as a triumph, but when we hit the triumphs, there are also these times of setback and loss. And I think the real message for me is to look back at the courage, at the commitment, at the suffering and the sacrifice that was made then, and to ask, what are we gonna do now in this stage of the civil rights movement.
Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. All right. So um, when I began to think about my remarks for today, uh, I had to do what we do wisely, and I went to the elders. I went home, um, really went to the telephone call and called my grandmother. Um, I had to ask her, my grandfather, who's no longer here, but he was in, in many ways his own activist, and I asked, what were his thoughts about it? Um, and she shared them with me. Um, she said, well, he wanted to go to the march, but I wouldn't let him. <laughs> he, had, he had a summer flu, and she just felt that he would be very sick, and, and he could not go. So again, in many ways, my thoughts about the past are intertwined, or will become intertwined with um, my thoughts about today. So bear with me as I take a short walk down my personal memory lane. Popot was born in 1922, one month to the day of the opening of the Lincoln Memorial. Being the elder in a family of nine children, Pop attended school only until the eighth grade, after which he took a job as a shoeshine boy at a local hotel to help with family expenses. Later, that job turned into a position at a local shoe cobbler. And for those of you who don't know, today's shoe tellers, shoe makers were called shoe cobblers in the back of the day. Where with an addition to serving as a janitor, he learned the craft of shoemaking. Subsequently, in 1940, Pop was drafted into the U.S. Army to serve in World War II. Upon revealing his skill as a cobbler, he was stationed in Marseille, Italy, to make boots for U.S. servicemen. And again, I ask you to bear with me as I go down this memory lane. Um, in Italy, um, an Italian shoemaker befriended him to help increase his skill set. This gentleman's actual name was Dionysus, and he wanted to name me, being his elder grandson, he wanted to name me Dionysus. And my mother said, I ain't named my baby that. <laughs> <laughs> Is what she told me. <laughs> so they cut it off, and, and now today I'm Dion. My, um, you know, they cut the, the YSUS off. My grandfather did name me, though. So sometime after returning um, to the States, my grandfather opened his, his own shoe shop. Um, news of his skill set grew, and eventually he made, um, he made a pair of shoes for another native son of New Jersey, Frank Sinatra, which, which moved on to make him making shoes for Sammy Davis and also Diana Ross. So, so as you might imagine, my grandfather became kind of popular as a New Jersey shoemaker. Um, in, 1963, um, in 1962, he eventually um, opened up his first shoe shop um, in an all-white town of Red Bank, New Jersey. As you might imagine, some of the citizens were not pleased. And as I, to as I was told, he received a number of threats to leave. But he stood his ground, and nevertheless, based on his skill set, his business flourished. At around the age of five, I began my Saturdays at Pop's shop. Um, as, as he often told me, when people ask you, when was your first job, you told me a five-year-old boy. You know. And he said, you know, my duties included sweeping and over and over counting the change or the money in the register, which didn't help my math skills as an undergrad, but I did it. However, one of my most vivid memories is of two customers, white males in particular, who would only come to the back door to receive their sh new or repaired shoes. Even at that young age, I found that strange and asked my grandfather about it. His response was, well, they don't want their friends seeing them walk through my front door. And of course, my next question was why? His answer, because we are black and they are white. Ironically, that was enough of an answer for me. You see, even in the 70s, I knew that race relations were skewed in America. Today, there is no denying we have made great strides in America. However, as Pop would say, there still isn't enough of the right people sitting at the table. For instance, last spring I received a call from a parent who had great concerns about her daughter and how her daughter was being treated in a particular class. This student felt that the professor was completely ignoring her and neglecting her. She would raise her hand, never be called. The professor would make or miss or reschedule office hours. That was in February 2013. After some intervention from the parent, things did change for the student. However, it puzzled me that in 2013, this act had occurred. Then I realized it is why units such as the Office of African American Affairs, the Carter G. Woodson Institute, and the Office of Diversity and Equity are very much needed at the University of Virginia. Our students still face and fight many challenges that the March participants of 1963 faced. Last year, I read a report in the Diverse Issues um, in Higher Education which stated that racially indifferent 
or non-inclusive campus climates negatively affect the relationship of students and keeping students of color retained in higher education. This professor's actions very much mirrored those who knocked at the back door of my grandfather's shop. In many ways, their lack of support for his business undermined proper practices and the prospect of economic equity. Just as the professor's lack of engagement with the students could have very well stunted her academic growth, her overall belief in higher education, and negatively impacted her retention at the University of Virginia. Thus, as I close, I ask you to ponder a few questions. What will you do to leave the world a better place than the one you entered? What will you be, do to validate the promissory note for students of color at the University of Virginia? What will you do to ensure that, as Dr. King said, now is the time to make justice a reality for all God's children? Thank you. Hello, everyone. This morning, as I was thinking about what I was going to do tonight, I pulled out a book I've had since childhood. It's a picture book about the life of Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and at the end of that book, it talks about how he didn't get to complete his dream because someone killed him. Um, but there are so many people who are still around who believe in that dream who will bring it to pass. And I think that um, that's a reason why a large part of my career has been about um, building community across lines of difference and building awareness. So this poem is about, um, it's an attempt to translate that work into poetry. So. I untangle hate like knotted shoelaces, persistently tending to one tangle at a time. Each intricately interwoven entanglement requires special care, demands my concentration, patience, commitment. These knots did not tie themselves. They came from other people's hands, hands that were hasty, hands that thought little of the delicate strands that hold us together as community, greedy hands with arrogant intentions that overlook the impact of their movement in the world. I understand the complexity but understanding doesn't relieve the strain and cramping of the task. As each issue unravels, another underlying difficulty is discovered, reminding me how hard this work is. I do not give up. I work meticulously, transparently, deliberately, providing mirrors so others can inspect themselves, removing barriers, inhibiting us from seeing each other, looking into my own eyes for resistance. I listen to the stories how she was called trailer trash growing up and now she overspends her credit card so she can fit in. How anger is as constant a companion for him as the number of times that his brown body provokes white women to crutch, clutch their purses and cross to the other side of the street. How she was called, how she was raped and assaulted but never told anyone preferring to live in the silent shame of believing it was her own fault how he hasn't felt safe here since 9-11 equated his face and his religious garb with terrorism and he isn't even Muslim. How she has a hard time seeing her own beauty ever since they said they'd never babysit for her in the summertime because her biracial skin is just too dark that time of year. How God was ripped from his heart by the words from some preacher's pulpit declaring he was an abomination that God could not love and their tangles have become my tangles and my knotted soul is desperate for freedom so I grasp at the isms with the delicacy of fingertips working their way through ensnared strands making space where there is little, loosening each hateful bond and replacing it with love. I work as if my life depends upon it because it does. My life and the lives of so many others distorted into matted mess need this, need others with unwearied hands to undo the years of untruth, unfairness, inhumanity. I am no superhero. This work requires the ordinariness of making mistakes and asking forgiveness, getting close to the ground where our lives are repeatedly tripped up, kneeling down into the soil where generations of overlapping silence, unintentional hurts, and deliberate discrimination have intertwined injustice, what we now know as normal. It is work we all must do. 
but it is work we will not do as long as we are comfortable. So I pray your feet like mine grow weary, blistered, and bruised by the status quo, that you feel the painful binding cords of bigotry and that it takes your breath away, that the sight of the bright red burns of bias stops the steady beat of your heart for just one second. Then, and only then, will the hope for a free world, a just world, become real. Then and only then will we realize we are all bound together by a common cord and live fearlessly knowing we are all one.